Imagine that this is an undiluted homeopathic preparation, a solution made from a single ingredient that has been dissolved in water. And that single ingredient could range from healthy tissue to diseased tissue to duck liver. Homeopathy holds that if you dilute the original preparation so that this mix is only a hundredth of this preparation here, and you dilute this over and over again, so only a minuscule amount of the original preparation remains, this will be much more potent than this. Homeopathy is found under the umbrella terms of complementary and alternative medicine. It is a pseudoscience, and by that I mean as much as people might believe in homeopathy, there is no scientific proof at all backing it up. Or, more exactly, there's plenty of proof that homeopathy works, just none from a scientific, controlled, upheld study showing anything beyond the placebo effect. Like all pseudosciences, or I suppose all science and non-science, it has a fascinating origin. Homeopathy was invented by Samuel Hahnemann in 1796, which was also the year of the Battle of Castiglione, which has nothing to do with anything, I'm just contractually obliged to mispronounce at least one thing every episode. Homeopathy. Homeopaths claim that Hippocrates may have been the first to use homeopathy, and father of toxicology, Paracelsus, may have expressed views similar to those Hahnemann would later develop. Hahnemann rejected contemporary medicine, much of which was harmful, and believed diseases to have both physical and spiritual causes. One day, Hahnemann ate some cinchona bark after translating a work by William Cullen which cited it as a cure for malaria. Hahnemann reportedly experienced malaria-like symptoms and concluded that for a drug to be effective, it must generate similar symptoms to the disease it's intended to treat. From this, he developed the fundamentals of homeopathy. Cinchona bark, by the way, does cure malaria because it contains quinine. Hahnemann believed in what he called like-for-like, like, the belief that you can alleviate symptoms with a diluted form of what causes symptoms. Now, as you might have guessed, homeopathy is practiced differently depending on the homeopath. Some use nosodes, based on pathological products such as blood, feces, or diseased tissue. And often nosodes, or nosodes, are used in lieu of traditional vaccines. But I have to say that they're not vaccines. Other homeopaths use sarcodes, or sarcodes, which use healthy tissue. Other homeopaths use things such as sunlight, magnetic fields, good vibrations. These are called imponderables and are questioned by traditional homeopaths. Hahnemann and many practitioners today, after approving, which is very much like a consultation, would take a special mix that they'd made of maybe alcohol or water, usually water, and mix it in with a single ingredient. Clinical homeopathy often mixes preparations together, but even then these preparations are almost always based on a single ingredient. And those ingredients could be anything. They could be silver, orange peel, a little bit of dandelion and burdock. Once they have their initial preparation, they've ground up their silver egg or their seagull brain or whatever it is, and they've dissolved it into water or alcohol, or maybe a combination of both, they start to shake it, and they start to bang it on something very elastic, like a saddlebag, or a very large trampoline in a very small garden. They're always in very small gardens, aren't they? There is no consensus on how much you shake the preparation, or how much you smack it, or really what you smack it against. As Galen once said, just do what you feel like, it's only medicine. They shake these substances in between every dilution. Which brings me to dilution, flawless writing. This is what I was talking about at the very beginning. Homeopathic remedies are diluted over and over again, the number of times depending on the remedy. The practice holds that the more a preparation is diluted, the more potent it becomes. And there are some remedies that are so diluted, there is no trace of the original solution used. And when I say no trace, I mean on a molecular level. A silicocinum, made from ground duck liver and intended to treat flu-like symptoms, is so diluted that it contains one part original preparation and one to the power of 400 parts water. That means that you would have to drink a remedy four times the size of the universe to get a single molecule. This is explained by water memory, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's the idea that water retains some information of things that it's come into contact with after it's diluted over and over again. Jacques Benveniste, 
in 1988, published a study that supported this theory, but has never been able to be replicated under controlled conditions. To be frank, um, I had talked uh, this whole Benveniste problem over with some colleagues of mine in America uh, who, who had been concerned with scientific fraud. And uh, they took the view that Benveniste was not a fraud, but it could well be that somebody in his lab was playing a trick on him. What we found was that his whole team was playing a trick on itself. They very rarely made these measurements blind, which meant that anyone who knew what he was looking for could bias his own counting to get the kind of answer he expected. Now, worse than that, his assistant, a woman called Elizabeth, kept the neatest notebook, but uh, she filled it in only after the experiments were done and didn't enter the experiments that didn't work. Now, so late into this video, I don't think it's necessary for me to say that, obviously, I am not a scientist nor meteorologist. Thanks. But I do wonder, if water can retain information like that, surely all the water in all of the world can remember almost everything. Richard Dawkins, to illustrate probability theory, said that when you drink a glass of water, there's a very good chance that a molecule in that water, at some point, passed through the body of Oliver Cromwell. Does water retain that information? Mmm, you can really taste the Puritan and his warts. What about if you take a homeopathic remedy, pee it out, it evaporates, rains back down, and it gets made into another homeopathic remedy? Is that a dual remedy? There are different explanations for this, ideas of being able to overwrite memory in water and things like that. However, seeing as water memory has never come close to being proven... Now, as I said earlier, the like-for-like -like aspect of homeopathy might sound a little bit like vaccinations. However, even homeopathic vaccinations are diluted over and over again, which means they're just as effective as vaccinating yourself with water. Because they are water. Homeopathy prevails today for a number of reasons. However, I think one of the chief reasons is that homeopathy is seen as a reaction to what is perceived to be a pharmaceutical industry that puts profit before everything else. Now, I think probably there's truth in that, just as there's a real debate to be had about whether we're medicating ourselves too much and whether the Western world is just too drugged up. Whilst those concerns may be valid, they in no way bolster the efficacy of homeopathy, only the appetite for it. I'm not attacking people who believe this stuff, you can believe whatever you want. Just don't call it medical and don't say it's scientifically proven, because it isn't. Some people say that members of the established medical community attack homeopathy as heresy. But I think that's wrong because it brings in the language of belief into the fray. If medical professionals decry homeopathy out of ideology, it is the ideology of medical professionalism. That is, to do no harm and to not peddle things which are completely unproven. I watched a lot of other videos on homeopathy before making this one, and on the videos where homeopathy was criticised, I saw a lot of comments, often from the same people, which accused the person on screen of being a pharmaceutical shill, or of just confirming their own biases, or of not understanding science. If homeopathy worked, I'd be all for it, because it would be a very cheap way of helping people. I don't think it shouldn't be studied, and I think exploratory research should be open-minded. But belief isn't good enough. It's not proven beyond the placebo effect. The placebo effect, which really deserves its own video, is a powerful thing. It can tangibly ease suffering, and that, in turn, can aid recovery. So in a way, homeopathy can work. But that's the same as giving someone a glass of water and saying it's medicine. Mmm, medicine. A large amount of flag-waving for homeopathy comes from testimonials, from people who really do believe. And yes, maybe homeopathy did cure your dog of bowel cancer, but there's no proof of that. Maybe it was spontaneous remission. Maybe it wasn't cured, the symptoms have just changed. Maybe it was prayer. Maybe your dog isn't your dog at all, but has been replaced by a pod dog, and it's now free of emotion and disease, and is going to rat out Veronica Cartwright. Finally, to cap this off, 
A recurring counter-argument to what I just said is, why is it okay to say that Western medicine cured this, but not say homeopathy cured this? Or, I knew someone who took their big pharma medicine for COPD, and they still died from COPD. I want to make really clear, I'm not championing modern medicine. There's clearly bureaucracy, politics, and will to profit behind it. It's not perfect, but there is an awful amount of evidence that it works. It is backed up evidentially, and evidently is effective. It is not faith-based, and that is why it is medicine and not witchcraft. People who practice homeopathy may or may not have the best intentions, and I'm sure a good amount of them really do think it's the best way to help people. But it's quackery. Edzard Ernst, who is a complementary and alternative medicine academic, sums it up like this. The biggest danger probably is that people use it, um, as, as the term implies, as an alternative. So if you have cancer or any other serious condition and you use homeopathy to cure it, then homeopathy, which otherwise is pretty harmless, becomes life-threatening. Thank you for watching. Please be sure to let me know what you think of homeopathy in the comments. Do you agree with me or am I an ignorant shill? Hello? Glaxo? I told you never to call me here! My last video was about BuzzFeed, and a lot of the comments I got on that video suggested that I take a look at something on the other end of the political spectrum too, which I think is a great idea. Thank you to everyone who commented that or upvoted one of those comments. So, next time on the Bizarre Summary, I'll be looking at Breitbart. See you then.